Dr. Milliker is a clinical associate professor at the Department of Cardiac Sciences uh, at the University of Calgary. Uh, he is the medical director of nuclear cardiology and the CT program there. He completed his internal medicine and cardiology training uh, at the University of Calgary and then went on to do fellowships in advanced heart failure and transplant at Stanford and advanced cardiac imaging at Cedar sinai um, His clinical work uh, includes nuclear cardiology, cardiac CT, uh, and advanced heart failure. Um, and his research in interests include advanced cardiac imaging applications in patients with cardiomyopathies, as well as epidemiology and heart failure and cardiac transplant patients. So um, we welcome him here today. We look forward to your presentation, Dr. Miller. Thanks for the introduction. That was great. Um, so today I'll be talking about AI applications in cardiac imaging. And that's because I thought I couldn't come here and talk to you about nuclear cardiology because you know so much, and I can't talk to you about heart failure and transplant because you know so much. So I thought I'd try to do something that maybe there's something I have to offer. Um, so these are my disclosures. Uh, they're not relevant really for the talk today. Uh, the bigger disclosure is I'm going to talk a lot about nuclear and less about other imaging. But really, the uh, especially the terminology translates, but the approaches translate as well. Um, so in terms of today's talk, we'll discuss some AI terminology just so we all have a basic understanding of where we're starting. Uh, we'll talk about image reconstruction application, segmentation, and then I'll talk a lot more about disease diagnosis and risk prediction, because I think that's something that's a bit more exciting for most cardiologists to discuss. Um, a little bit delayed, but so AI terminology. Um, so artificial intelligence, just if you look at it as a broad field, is any algorithm that performs a task normally we assign to human intelligence. So it could be pattern recognition, it could be um, language recognition, it could be identifying patterns uh, or drawing circles uh, around specific structures, as you'll see. Um, so when we talk about AI, the two big categories you'll see in the cardiac literature is machine learning and deep learning. So machine learning, you can think about it as like a tree-based algorithm. So it picks classifiers and then it decides how best to split patients based on those classifiers. And then it builds a series of trees to get some sort of prediction. So for a lot of the work we do, the prediction is, do they have coronary disease or no coronary disease? Um, so if you look at XGBoost, which is one of the more popular machine learning algorithms, it's also a tree-based algorithm. It just develops many trees and then uses each tree as a classifier. Um, but the underlying idea is that you have these classifiers, uh, just like we do in everyday clinical life, that predict high versus low risk. So what are the benefits of machine learning? It's really good at integrating a vast array of information. So if you have lots of clinical and imaging data and you want to try to integrate it all objectively, machine learning's quite good at this. The trouble is if you give it bad data, you will not get a good result. So just like any other statistical model, the data is important. And in particular for machine learning, if you feed any of the training data, and use that data for testing, the algorithm can learn to memorize the, the observations. So you have to make sure that all of the training data is totally separate from the testing data. And we'll talk about different ways that we can do that. Uh, the next uh, good thing about machine learning is it has no idea which variable is important. So you don't tell it what you think is important, it just decides. The trouble with that is it may tell you something's important and it can take days or weeks to figure out actually why that would be important. Um, so one example of that is if we look at like machine learning for post-transplant outcomes, hep C in donors becomes quite important, but it's probably that it's associated with other risk factors in those same donors rather than the hepatitis C by itself. Um, and then interpretability becomes an important consideration when you're looking at the models and how you develop them. Um, and the last good thing is it 
inherently handles interactions and nonlinear relationships. So one of the biggest knocks against machine learning is people will say you can do the same thing with logistic regression or Cox models. And it's true if you handled all of the interactions and the nonlinear aspects of the model, you probably get the same results. You just take you a lot longer. So that's machine learning. When we talk about deep learning, uh, all it's referring to is this multi-layered learning approach. And hopefully I can get the right pointer tool up. So it's not gonna work. So here the blue is like an input layer and then the green is an inner hidden layer. So the functionality of the deep learning model depends on how the inner hidden layers are, are structured. But the general sense is that you put some sort of input into the input layer, which is typically an image, and then you ask it to produce some sort of output layer. That's okay. So, as I was saying, the structure of the inner hidden layer sort of determines what you can do with the specific deep learning model. So, convolutional neural networks are used quite frequently in image analysis. So if your question is, does this person have coronary disease from a spect or a pet? Uh, convolutional neural networks are usually used as the architecture. So all that's important about a convolutional neural network compared to other neural networks is only the nearby nodes talk to each other. So what that does is it preserves the spatial relationships of the image through the deep learning network. Whereas with the classic artificial neural network, all the nodes talk to each other, so the spatial information is jumbled. Uh, the second um, model here is called a convolutional autoencoder. So this is used for image denoising. So the interesting thing here is the inner hidden layers have less um, space compared to the input or the output layer. And then you just ask the model to copy the input image to the end. And then what that does is it forces the model just to choose the features that are most important from that image and carry them forward. And then the unit I put up here, because we'll talk about it a little bit, is a specialized autoencoder. So it has these skip connections that take the fine details of the input image and just copy it directly over to the output image. And that produces some denoising, but also preserves that image detail towards the end of the model. So what are the benefits of deep learning? Uh, you can do direct image interpretation. So you just map each portion of the image to the input layer of the model and then task it with something through the model. Uh, it identifies latent image features, which is both a, a benefit but also a downside. And then it also has no preconception about what's important. So here explainability is really critical because you could have a model that works really well, but it might not be identifying what you think it is. So this was a model that was trained to identify either non-COVID pneumonia or COVID pneumonia. And then the built-in uh, gradient class uh, activation mapping. And what that does is it tells you what portion of the image the deep learning model is identifying as being important. So here, if you look, uh, you can see in the normal patient, it's identifying X-ray tags, lack of central lines, really nothing inside the lungs was important to this prediction. The things that were important were uh, the patient position. So you can figure that out from how much of the table is visible. So if they're supine and being imaged in the ICU, you get some activation from the COVID across the bottom and it's seeing central lines. Lungs were totally unimportant, but it was really, really accurate. Um, so explainability is really critical for deep learning models or else you have no idea what it's seen. Um, so moving on to this is training and testing. So uh, people will talk about uh, cross-validation and they'll talk about five and tenfold cross-validation, but the general idea is that you're picking people randomly to be used for training and testing. And then you do that multiple times so that you avoid variability that's related to just who is picked for testing. Um, so this is uh, one outline of what fivefold cross-validation might look like, where you have some patients from each of the sites included in training and in testing. You can do the same uh, sort of uh, concept with three sites, but use repeated external testing. And there, there's some sort of patient 
feature that you use to classify who should be used for training and testing. Typically it's sites because sites have patients that are relatively the same. Um, and you just use one site only for testing and then use the remaining sites for training. Um, but most important thing here is, again, you don't have any data that's used for testing available during training or else it will be memorized at some point. Uh, so this is another uh, approach that can be used specifically for transplant. So we have like huge transplant databases that are really representative of lots of groups, but sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly which site is important, but more specifically for transplant, um, over time, the patients who are undergoing transplants have changed quite a bit. So it's actually more important to select people by year rather than by site, because by year gives you more specific information for that transplant year. So this was a project that we did in the UNOS database, which is uh, anybody who's received a heart or heart lung transplant. But here we just looked at the heart transplants. And we looked at two different methods for training and testing. So the first is shuffled. So this is like cross validation where we use patients from all of the years for training and testing and just chose them randomly. And then we did rolling cross validation, which is like simulating prospective applications. So what you do is you select some patients for training and then you test it in the following year. So just like we would develop any sort of statistical model and then apply it prospectively. This was simulating that, but just with machine learning. So the important thing here is if we did shuffle tenfold cross-validation, um, our accuracy was fantastic. We, this, so this was prediction for one year mortality and we were getting AUCs of 0 0.89. But when we looked at that um, rolling cross-validation, which is simulating prospective um, application, the AUCs are 0 0.6. Um, so this gets to the point of you have to understand what's making your patients unique and it might not just be sites, it might be changes over time that are also important. Um, and the last terms that you might see and I just wanted to introduce briefly is supervised learning versus unsupervised learning. So supervised learning, you tell the model uh, what you want to find out. So again, it could be, do patients have coronary disease? Yes or no. And that's your target is like, try to predict coronary disease. With unsupervised learning, there's no specific target. You just give it a data set and say, try to make groups out of this. And this is uh, interesting if you want to do patient phenotyping, uh, because it doesn't have any preconceptions about what should be the grouping factors. So it can give you some insights into the patient population but it's not specifically being used for an outcome prediction. So it's not necessarily the most efficient for that. It's more efficient for phenotyping. Um, so moving on to some applications. Um, so this is a uh, paper that looked at image reconstruction, and this was a denoising algorithm essentially. So what they were doing was trying to see if you could do lower doses of spec images and reproduce the same outcome as a, a full dose. Um, so this is a pretty typical application for image reconstruction in nuclear because we're always very concerned about radiation dose. Um, so here what you can see is on the top row, it's the standard dose images. Uh, the second row is the half dose images and then quarter dose and one eighth dose. So as you can see, as you decrease the radiation dose, the image quality is substantially reduced. Uh, and then from the bottom, what you get is the predicted full dose from the half dose reconstruction, the predicted full dose from the quarter dose and predicted from one eighth dose. So you can see that by applying this uh, deep learning model for uh, improving image quality, you can regain some of the image quality that you lose by decreasing radiation. So this has a pretty uh, obvious clinical application that you could just decrease your radiation dose by half and get images that are pretty much the same as a full dose image. So it's pretty clear implications for improving patient outcomes or patient uh, radiation doses. Um, so images are just one thing that we should look at when we're looking at deep learning models and their applications. There's a lot more quantitative analysis that you can do to see how similar those images are. 
So this study just looked at the Pearson correlation. And what you can see is that uh, by predicting the full dose with the deep learning model, you can improve the correlation with the actual image counts. Um, and really by the time you get to a quarter dose with the predicted full dose, it's pretty much the same as an actual full dose image. Um, so this is an uh, application that's a bit more specific for SPECT. So instead of just decreasing the radiation dose, you could also decrease the imaging time by half. So here, what they did was they simulated either missing frames from uh, the acquisition or um, which is sort of this uh, FP, full projection prediction, or full time. So you can have the same number of projections, but half the time. So that's essentially simulating a half dose just by getting rid of either the projections or the time per projection. So um, in these papers, it's always good to look at what the model is just so you have an understanding of what the architecture looks like. So just like the si simulated architecture I showed you, there's an input layer. It's going through these hidden layers where it's actually expanding, and then there's an output layer. So here the input is either the half time projections or the half projection images, and the prediction or the output is full time full prediction images. Um, so this is again looking at the image quality. So on the top you have the full time full projection images, um, and then the project or sorry the predicted either from uh, the half time images. So this is the FT side. So this is predicted full time and predicted full projections. And I would say the images are pretty much the same. So here you would argue that you could get rid of half of your imaging time or you could cut your radiation dose in half and apply this and get pretty similar images. Um, but it's even more important to start looking at some of the uh, quantitative measures that you can look at once you start getting into these models. Um, so here we're looking at mean error, mean absolute error, relative error, absolute relative error, and then the structural similarity index. And all of those are used quite frequently in image reconstruction tasks because it's a quantitative measure that tells you exactly how similar your images are. Because a lot of the fine details you can't just see with the naked eye. Um, so here they were able to demonstrate that both the predicted full time and predicted full projection images were structurally very similar when you get into the quantitative analysis of the images. Um, so this is some work I was involved with recently. So here we gave the deep learning model a different task. So here the task was to provide attenuation correction. So for SPECT, we have a lot of soft tissue attenuation. We get diaphragmatic artifacts, things like that. And a lot of sites, including my own, use CT attenuation to correct for that. Uh, but here we were developing a deep learning model to do it automatically. So you could do it without a CT. So the structure of this model is called a generative adversarial network. Um, so the way to think about it is a lot like the way we treat our trainees. So you take two models and you make them compete. So the first model is generating the pseudo AC model or the deep AC model, we called it. And then the second model is just tasked with differentiating real CT images from this um, deep AC images. So you keep training that until the generative model can completely fool the discriminator, and then you say that it's fully trained. So it's a way to force the model to improve upon itself. Uh, here, the structure of the generator is a UNET model. So you can see that it's a decreasing uh, width of the model through the inner hidden layers, but we're using those skip connections to carry across some of the fine image details. Um, and at the end, we were tasking it with creating these pseudo AC models or deep AC, deep AC images. Um, so this is looking at some of the cases. Uh, so on the left, you have NC non-corrected images. In the middle, it's the actual AC, and on the right is the deep AC images. So on the NC, you can see that there's a mild defect in the inferior wall um, that 
Jordan will tell you is like seen on almost all of our patients when we're imaging on our current camera system. And that's consistent with a diaphragmatic artifact. And you can see that it's corrected with actual AC, it's corrected with the deep AC. And on the right, this is a one quantitative measure. So this is called change analysis. So it's looking at uh, areas where there are increased counts when you apply the AC uh, or compared to the AC. So you can see for AC versus NC, there's a lot of activation in the inferior wall, and that's just where it's correcting the diaphragmatic artifact. And AC versus deep AC, you can see that there's really no positive change. Uh, so one other case here with a real defect, uh, just to show you that it's not just covering up all the defects. So here there's um, a defect in the lateral wall, really extending anterolateral to infralateral that's severe. It partially corrects with CTAC, uh, suggesting that it is probably a real defect. And it looks very similar with the deep AC once it's applied. Um, so again, it's important to look at these models just to make sure that they're not just making everything normal because that's not clinically helpful for us. Uh, and then one more case that has a diaphragmatic defect. So we went on to do different quantitative analyses from these. Uh, so this is uh, the change analysis for the whole population, just showing that positive change is much lower uh, for AC versus deep AC compared to AC versus NC, suggesting that um, there aren't a lot of residual defects that AC is correcting. And then um, I really like more firm clinical outcomes. So we looked at diagnostic accuracy. Um, so in this uh, population, we included a cohort of patients that went for cath and a cohort of patients that were low likelihood and really had um, no reason to have coronary disease that we just assumed were CAD negative. Um, so here we showed that the diagnostic accuracy for ACU was significantly higher than eight NC, so AC of 0 0.81 compared to 0 0.7. And the deep AC model was really not significantly different from AC and only slightly decreased compared to AC, so AC of 0 0.79. Um, this slide is to just hammer home the point that you really have to look at the output of the model. Uh, so this was an early version of the model. And on the left is the actual AC image, and on the right is the deep AC image. And I think we can all agree that this would make no sense to see clinically. I assume everybody's here looked at polar maps before. Although we use a bullseye to score them, it's not supposed to have rings like an actual dartboard. Um, so this was related to how it was upsampling towards the end of the hidden layer. So uh, again, it's really important to look at the actual image outputs for these before you start applying them clinically, because um, especially the GAN model is prone to this type of artifact. Um, and just to make everybody more uncomfortable, it's called hallucination artifact when it generates these art, uh, like pseudo image artifacts. OK, so moving on to segmentation. So this is work from David Wu Yang. Um, and he's kindly posted it all on GitHub, but this is a deep learning model that segments echoes. Um, and they've done several studies, but the uh, basic workflow is you start with an echo. They classified all of the image acquisitions or the view classifications. They crop the data and then feed it these mini loops. Um, and then the deep learning model was trained to uh, segment from expert reader segmentations. Um, and then uh, they looked at the actual uh, correlation between predicted and actual outcome. Um, so here, looking at the correlation between different volume measurements, you can see that the uh, correlations are pretty good. And I would say that it, this is comparable, at least in my mind, to what we would see between two expert readers, um, where we know that uh, echo segmentation or estimation of EF from biplanar can vary quite a bit from reader to reader. Um, they also looked at whether or not this model could identify abnormalities. So the first is, can it see pacemaker leads? And the answer is, yeah. I mean, that's not the most difficult task. But the important thing here is when you look at where the deep learning model is identifying pacemaker leads, it's 
actually in locations that pacemaker leads would exist. Um, similarly, it can be used to predict uh, left atrial enlargement, left ventricular hypertrophy, and when you look at the GradCam maps, it's locating to areas that would make sense. So for the LA prediction, it's mostly in the LA, a little bit in the left ventricle, sort of makes sense. And for LVH, it's really just seeing the myocardium. So this is exciting because they did the first randomized trial. So it got a lot of press at uh, ESC. So this trial was, uh, they took scans and then randomized it either to AI doing the segmentation or a sonographer doing the segmentation for the EF. And then they gave it back to cardiologists, didn't tell them who did what. And they asked like, how frequently do you change your ejection fraction by more than 5%? So um, the reason people were excited about it is for the deep learning segmentation, uh, the readers were less likely to change their EF by more than 5% compared to sonographers. This is a task that nobody really wants to do, like drawing circles and modifying uh, EF segmentation is something that takes a lot of time. Um, and if you can do it quicker and more accurately with deep learning, why not spend your time elsewhere? Uh, you could get more echoes done. You could look at valve disease in more depth. Um, so it's a way that sonographers could save their time. Uh, there's another time consuming uh, task that you could do, which is segmenting coronary calcium. Um, so this is looking at CT attenuation scans, and it's a paper I put together with one of our fellows. Uh, but what we currently do is we just do an expert estimate of how much calcium is there. And we say either it's absent, present, or extensive. And we just looked at simple outcomes in a large SPECT cohort. And you can see that with more calcium, you're more likely to experience MACE, which is um, not surprising to anybody. Um, but it was actually pretty consistent across the spectrum of perfusion abnormalities. Here, looking at some stress score, which is a measure of stress perfusion abnormality. And you can see that with increasing calcium, really, regardless of perfusion, there's an increased risk of MACE. Um, but if you actually wanted to segment out the calcium, it would take quite a bit of time. So you can do it on any CT scan. It's just more accurate if it's an ECG-gated, dedicated uh, coronary artery calcium scan. Uh, here we developed a model to segment out calcium from CT attenuation scans, and then compared it to expert reader calcium uh, scores. So uh, you can see that the training population is just over 6,800 patients. And then we did external testing uh, in terms of the prognostic significance of the calcium scores on a third site. Um, and how the model works is it's a convolutional long short-term memory deep learning model. All you need to take out of that long uh, sentence is that it looks at the adjacent slices rather than just a single slice. So just like any of us look at a CT scan or any imaging, the adjacent slices can give you information in terms of whether or not something's artifact or it's metal. Um, so this deep learning model was trained to do the same thing, where it looks at the adjacent slices and maybe it gets rid of calcium that's on one slice and then disappeared above and below. Um, and it had two tasks. One task was just outline the heart because we wanted to exclude all the calcium outside of the heart. And then the second task was uh, highlight the calcium within the mask. Uh, so this is looking at some case examples. Um, so on the top, you can see that the patient had a calcium score of over 2000. Um, and in the middle is the expert score and the green highlight is around aortic calcification. The red highlight is over coronary calcification. And you can see that the segmentation is really the same between expert reader and deep learning. Uh, the second is looking at uh, what we see frequently in our SPECT lab, which is somebody with a BMI of 47. And you can see that the image quality is terrible and grainy. Uh, but both the expert reader and the deep learning score correctly identified no calcium. And then on the third, you can see a bit more challenging segmentation tasks. So. Uh, this is calcium in the RCA, which is in red, and the mitral annulus, which is in green. And as you know, the circumflex is running right beside the mitral annulus, and this is an area that 
a lot of deep learning models get confused on, but really it's an area a lot of us get confused on, uh, cardiologists included. Um, so next we looked at the agreement between the expert reader and the deep learning scores, and you can see that the agreement's quite good with a kappa of 0 0.8. Uh, and then most importantly, we looked at risk prediction. So this was in that external cohort, so it wasn't used in any way during the, the model training. And you can see that the risk stratification of calcium scores is very similar between expert reader and deep learning scores. Um, so we went on to look at net reclassification. So you can see with either of the calcium scores that the overall net reclassification is a little bit better than just expert reader uh, visual estimate. Um, which really is actually quite good by itself and pretty quick. Uh, the biggest difference is deep learning scores you get in less than one second. Expert reader segmentation takes about five minutes, and even the estimates would take you more than a second. So if you apply deep learning, it's a task that you could just get rid of, get rid of segmentation tasks and focus on image interpretation and risk predictions. Um, we applied the same thing to PET uh, CT attenuation data. The difference here was there were also paired ECG gated scans. So the expert readers annotated the ECG gated scans and the deep learning model annotated just the CT attenuation scans. And you can see that it's still providing uh, really robust risk stratification even when you compare an inferior scan to like what we would consider gold standard scan for calcium scoring. Um, so you're going to say, well, segmenting calcium is really easy. Why would I offload that to deep learning? Um, maybe this will convince you. So you can also segment uh, epicardial adipose tissue. Uh, so this is essentially circling all the fat around the heart. So I think that's a task none of us want to do. It takes about 30 minutes to do it manually, but this uh, deep learning model was trained to segment it automatically, which it does in just over a second. Um, so the first study uh, was done by Frederick Commander, and he showed that there was good correlation between the manual segmentation and the expert segmentation. Um, and then Evan Eisenberg applied this to a larger population to look at risk stratification. And it's, to me, really interesting that if you look at both calcium as well as epicardial adipose tissue volume, you can really provide uh, even greater risk stratification than you could do with either alone. Um, so it's a, a biomarker that is really looking for um, a deep learning segmentation model that's highly accurate because none of us want to do this in clinical practice, but it clearly has a good utility. It's just a matter of applying it uh, to actual work. Uh, so moving on to something that is hopefully a bit more exciting for people. This is disease diagnosis and risk prediction. Um, and I, I'll go through a series of papers um, just to show different approaches to this. This is uh, a relatively simple task. So for this paper we were looking at, can you use machine learning to figure out who's going to have abnormal perfusion on spec if you just give it the pretest features? So it's age, sex, past medical history, indication, and then trying to predict who's going to have abnormal perfusion from that. So we did two types of testing. The first is tenfold cross-validation. So this was in 20,000 patients. Um, and as you can see, it's sort of random assortment uh, to who's used for training, testing, and validation. And then we also did external testing where we added two sites, 9,000 patients totally separate from the model training uh, process. And we used XGBoost for this. Uh, so on the left, you can see the prediction performance for abnormal perfusion, AUC of 0 0.83, just because the text is pretty small for you. Um, and pretty typically, the prediction performance will drop off in the external testing. But you can see here that it's still significantly better compared to the CAD clinical model, which is the CAD consortium clinical model. Uh, or the updated Diamond Forrester model, um, or the CAD basic model. Um, and so potentially this is something you could apply to select patients for stress-first imaging to decrease radiation dose. So if you know they're going to have normal perfusion and you really want to do a SPECT, 
those patients could be stressed first and then probably skip their rest scan. Um, or uh, you could say, well, maybe we should do a CT instead because I know perfusion is going to be normal. Maybe CT will give me better information, um, but it's potentially a way to help us improve non-invasive test selection. Um, so as soon as you start talking about test selection, you have to talk about calibration. So there's different ways to graphically describe calibration, but the concept is how well does your predicted risk be, match your actual risk? So here we looked at deciles of score, and in the blue is the predicted risk, the red is the actual risk, and you can see that there's, um, sorry, I got that backwards. Blue is actual, red is predicted. You can see that there's good correlation between the two, uh, both in the internal population, but also in the external population. And then the Breyer score is just a quantitative measure of that. Um, and usually you want it closer to 0 0.1. Um, but it's important to look at both the training and the external testing populations. Um, so for XGBoost, it has a cool feature. It'll tell you which predictors are most important in the prediction. So this is good to look at just to make sure that it's not identifying something that makes no clinical sense. Um, so here are the things it's uh, identifying, uh, history of coronary disease, previous MI. I think we would all agree that makes sense. Uh, other than that, it's age, sex, BMI, um, and other features that would make sense in that specific prediction. Um, so you can uh, also apply this after the stress scan. So here the question was, if you have just the stress uh, images, can you identify who you could cancel the rest scan for? Um, so we looked at this from two different perspectives. The first is, can you use machine learning to identify patients who don't have coronary disease? Um, so here we included a larger number of features. That's the only reason I put this uh, image up. You're not meant to read any of the features. Uh, and then we looked at prediction for obstructive coronary disease with the machine learning model compared to TPD, which is total perfusion deficit, which is a quantitative measure of perfusion, or expert readers. Um, and you can see that the machine learning score had higher prediction performance. And then we looked at different thresholds, and those were chosen to correlate to different sensitivities. Um, and you can see that uh, at one of those thresholds, the machine learning model had a much higher uh, negative predictive value. So patients with a low score were much less likely to have A, any coronary disease, or any high-risk coronary disease or left main disease. So it's a way that you could select patients for rest scan cancellation who have a very low probability of having obstructive coronary disease. Um, the second question we asked was, uh, yeah, we can rule out obstructive coronary disease, but really what we care about is outcomes most of the time. So this machine le learning model was built the same way, but here the prediction uh, task was MACE. So can you identify patients with a low risk of MACE for rest scan cancellation? Um, so again, the prediction performance was significantly better for machine learning compared to either stress TPD or expert readers. Um, and if you look at high versus low risk patients, low risk being blue, high risk being red, you can see that um, the low risk patients by machine learning, which is at the bottom, are much lower risk compared to the low risk patients by either TPD or expert readers. But the real issue here is like, that's a ton of information to try to collect. So um, our next question was, well, how much of this do you actually need? Because as you can see, there's some variables that have a lot of importance towards the top. There's a ton of variables that are below zero that we just cut off out of the figure and really you could just get rid of. Uh, so that was the purpose of this next paper, which was um, how much of this is actually important. Um, so again, what we did was we had a single population for uh, internal training and cross-validation, and then we had a held out population for external testing. Um, and we compared uh, several different models. But the first thing we started with was uh, picking out the most important variables. So here we just rank them by importance. And then what we did was we developed a series of machine learning models, just adding one feature at a time until prediction performance is plateaued. And once it plateaus, 
we say, well, that's the minimum number that you need to get good prediction performance. Everything after that, you're really wasting your time trying to collect it without improving the prediction performance. Um, so here we looked at the different machine learning models and uh, compared them. Uh, so this was for MACE prediction within the internal testing population. So orange is ML all, which is all of the features. And red is a minimum set of image and minimum set of clinical predictors. And you can see that the AUC only drops by 0.1%. Uh, but we got rid of 75% of the variables. So it would take you 75, like 25% of the time to get the data together but you get the same prediction performance. So then we looked at external testing. There was a little bit more of a drop off in performance in the external testing, but it was still 1% less. So you could have 25% of the data, only 1% drop off in prediction performance for MACE, which is a pretty good trade off. The second issue that happens when you have so many variables is inevitably a lot of them have missing values. So then our question was, well, what's the best way to address the missing values? Because uh, personally, this was the biggest criticism we got of all our papers. It's like, how many missing values do you have? How are you dealing with them? And there was no good paper that we could point to and say, well, like, forget about it, or like, we had this approach. So we developed this paper. It was uh, the same 20,000 patients, but here we just did internal cross-validation. Uh, and we looked at different imputation methods for the values. So the first method we looked at was just get rid of them. So if you know there's a bunch of missing values in a specific variable, just get rid of it, see if prediction performance drops off. The second is traditional imputation where it's median values for continuous variables and a missing uh, code if it's a category. And then we looked at uh, a cluster analysis where you do like mini clusters and then take the value from patients that are most similar within the clusters uh, and then multiple imputation and regression. Um, and this was like the overall result, which is if you have the machine learning with all of the values, the prediction performance is higher. If you just get rid of the uh, variables with missing values, that was actually the second best approach. And then if you look across all of the imputation methods, their prediction performance ends up about the same. So it's a lot of discussion about how you should do it without much difference in prediction performance. Um, then we looked at like how many variables have to have missing values before you start to have a drop off in prediction performance. So here we looked at the multiple imputation, which is in blue and ML remove, where you just get rid of the variables. And you can see that with ML remove, you can have three variables with missing values before you start to have drop off in prediction performance. So if you know you're going to be missing a lot of BMI, just get rid of it in your model. You're not going to lose much. Um, whereas with the multiple imputation, there's sort of a slow and steady drop off. But really, even once you get out to 7% or sorry, seven missing variables, you're not having that much drop off in prediction performance. You're only dropping prediction performance by 2%. So maybe you also just don't care. Um, so this is a different type of approach. So this is deep learning. So this is a explainable deep learning model and the inputs are polar maps from SPECT. Um, and the cool thing about this is it's using gradient weighted class activation mapping. And it uses that to show you what areas the deep learning model is seeing as important. And it shows you two, two different ways. The first is the attention map where it just highlights it with that yellow red color. And then there was a CAD probability map which highlights the segments and codes them according to how important they are. And then you get per vessel probability. Um, so this is a case example here, a patient with a LED lesion that you can see the deep learning model is appropriately identifying. Uh, we first started looking at um, diagnosis of obstructive coronary disease. So you can see that CADDL, which is that explainable deep learning model, has improved prediction compared to TPD or expert reader. Um, and if you pair this uh, specificity so that it matches expert reader, the sensitivity is significantly higher with the deep learning model. 
Uh, we also did external testing with this and that held up in external testing in terms of the prediction performance. Um, but when you get these results, the question is like, really, what are you going to do with it? So this is a case where there is a defect in the inferior wall that's partially reversible that I think all of us can see, um, which would make us think RCA disease. But here the deep learning model is saying, well, actually the apex is important too. And I think there's a high probability of LED disease. So maybe readers could look at this and like increase their probability that there's LED disease. Uh, this patient ended up having distal LED plus a mid RCA lesion. So the deep learning model was correct. And then if you look at this image, you'd say, well, that's kind of noisy. I think some of us would have trouble saying it's a normal scan, but deep learning says it's normal. So maybe you'd look at that result and like decrease your scoring. So we uh, developed this study to try to assess whether or not readers could use that information to improve their predictions. So here what we did was we had three readers. We got them to read 240 cases the same way we'd read any spec scan. So they got the clinical data, they got the ECG data, um, and they got the stress results and the perfusion. And they scored them per vessel. Uh, and then they repeated the whole thing, but with an explainable deep learning prediction. And the question is, are you going to do better when you get the explainable deep learning result? Um, so this is looking at prediction performance for uh, coronary disease. So you can see that the expert readers with deep learning had improved prediction performance compared to the expert readers without deep learning uh, with AUC of 0 0.78 compared to 0 0.75. So 3% improvement in accuracy. Um, and if you look at each reader independently, you can see that all of their prediction performance trends up for each of the readers with one reader significantly improving. So if you look at each of these readers individually, you'd say, well, the first reader has some improvement in sensitivity and some improvement in specificity. This is like an AI believer. If the deep learning model tells them it's abnormal, call it abnormal. If the deep learning model tells you it's normal, you call it normal. The second person is like using AI as a rule out. So if the deep learning model says there's something there that you don't think is there, you're not going to believe it. So your sensitivity doesn't improve. But if the deep learning model tells you it's normal, and you think it's maybe normal, you call it normal. So it's increasing your specificity. The third person is sort of a little bit sensitivity, a little bit specificity. I'll call them a cautious skeptic. Uh, so this gets into like the psychology of how people interact with machines in general. Um, so the other thing I'll say about this paper is uh, this was the first time those three readers used the model. And you would think that the more you use it, the more uh, improvement in prediction you would see because you get used to sort of how the machine or the deep learning model works. Uh, this is just looking at net reclassification for the expert readers. So by applying the deep learning model for the expert reader interpretation, there's a net reclassification improvement of 17%, which is pretty good. Um, so I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to go through this pretty quick. This is the same model. Here we said, instead of telling us if there's coronary disease, tell us if somebody's going to die, because that's important. So here was death or MI. Uh, we did both this internal cross validation as well as external testing. Here it was the external population with 9,000 patients. Uh, so this is looking at prediction performance in the uh, internal and external population. And you can see that uh, here looking at normal reader and low DL is blue. Normal or abnormal reader and low DL is green. Really, those lines aren't that different. Uh, orange is the normal reader interpretation, but high deep learning risk. And then red is abnormal for both. And you can see that the high deep learning uh, risk can either you could use it in conjunction with your read to provide some risk ratification, or you could just say, well, that high deep learning risk patients are much higher risk than the low deep learning risk patients. Uh, so here we looked at prediction performance, and you can see that prediction for the deep learning model was significantly improved compared to either stress or ischemic TPD. Um, and you can apply the same approach to PET. So if you just take the flow maps 
Um, you can look at stress and uh, MFR flow maps and improve prediction performance for PET MPI. Um, and last but not least, this is a cluster uh, analysis. So this is unsupervised uh, learning. Uh, so here it's a cluster algorithm and it's tasked with um, identifying groups that are as different as possible. So you don't tell it the number of groups or the grouping features, and it just tells you the optimal number of groups and how they should be classified. And then you can make these nice graphs that have like components of the classifiers. Uh, so here we did uh, both the internal training as well as external population. And you can see that the clusters hold up fairly well actually in the external testing. Um, this is looking at the features that are important in the clusters. And this is where it's really important to have a clinician involved in this type of work because you can look at the features and try to pick out what's important. Uh, so here the important things were actually exercise versus pharmacologic stress because there's a lot of features associated with that. So it's like your stress heart rate is much higher if you do exercise stress than if you do farm stress. Uh, your stress blood pressure is much higher, all the rest of it. So here are the important features. Uh, really the biggest classifier was exercise stress. And then other things like the perfusion were less important. Um, so this is looking at risk stratification across the clusters here in the training population. And you can see that there's pretty robust risk stratification across the groups, uh, which did hold up in the external testing population with the clusters based off of that first training population. Um, so I, I tried to leave 10 minutes for questions. Uh, if I don't get your question, feel free to email me. Uh, 